Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, our next lecture uh, with uh, continuing the previous lecture on magnetic vector potential for infinitesimal dipole antenna. So I kept the last screen that we had for uh, from the previous lecture so that uh, you can remind yourself about what happened in the previous lecture. And this in this lecture, I'm going to continue with our previous discussion. So to remind you what happened in the previous lecture, uh, perhaps I can remove this and remind you about what happened. So what happened was I started with the current of uh, infinitesimal dipole antenna. I assume the current is uniform along the dipole antenna. So uh, we had a uniform current, we call it I. So that's our current or I naught. So this was our unit current. Again, I'm reminding you, I naught is a phasor, so it has time variation. So this is our I naught, and uh, if you remember, we emphasized that the currents are in phase on the two arms of the dipole. That's extremely important. That's why this can radiate, and a transmission line cannot radiate. Transmission line, as you see in the previous lecture, had out of phase current. This one has in phase current so that's the whole trick here so uh, now we started with that then from here we derive a because we assume that this is the z direction uh, i is in the z direction so a was a z z hat it was in the z direction and this was essentially the expression for a that we had that was our a for this antenna we identify I naught L and this term as the important term here. And then from that, A was in Cartesian coordinate. So we converted that to a spherical coordinate. So that was from here, we went to A R, A theta, and A phi. And that was our conversion that I wrote here. And now this was the point that I stopped in the previous lecture. Now I want to continue after this point. So to do that, let me let me get rid of this. I'm going to keep that because that was my A. So, so let me write down my A at R was mu naught 4 pi I naught L e to the power of minus J K R R z hat so this is my magnetic vector potential and from this magnetic vector potential in z i have now magnetic vector potential in a spherical coordinate now i want to find my e and h of this antenna so i have two options as i mentioned in the previous lecture i could go directly to far field which would be what we mainly do in this course that's easy to do as you're going to see. And the other one is to use the general formula so that we can also cover the near field zone. Now, uh, it depends which one we want to do first. I would say let's uh, start with the easier one. So let's let's do uh, find E and H from far field approximation. So this is my A, and I'm going to be concerned with finding change that finding e and h of the antenna in the far field zone so why far field is easy because we could we could actually do uh, some approximation as you see in my lecture on uh, magnetic vector potential and the heart of this approximation is this one that in the far field, I know that ER is zero. So the radial component of E vanishes because the radiation is in the R direction, R hat direction. So E is perpendicular to that. So E in the R uh, would be zero. And E theta is very simple, in fact. E theta is just minus J omega A theta. But we already had A. In Cartesian and then we converted our a to a theta so my a theta is present here is 
minus sine theta AZ. So I can just substitute it here, and that's going to become J omega sine theta AZ. So you see, I just I just substituted for A theta here, and I have my E theta. Now, what about E phi? E phi, if you remember, in the far field is minus J omega A phi. Your A phi is zero, so your A phi is also zero. So that's actually very easy because you see that ER, that in the far field always vanishes. E phi is in this particular case is zero. And uh, the, the other thing would be you have only E theta. So that's, that would be our, that would be our uh, situation right here. And ER, I already explained for you that if you're radiating toward R hat, of course, your E needs to be perpendicular to R hat because it's a plane wave. The E component is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So you can easily understand that. But E phi, you may have a little bit of problem here understanding. But uh, let me assume that this is a dipole antenna. And now E phi means this is these, if you have some an E that rotates like this, that's E phi. Remember, if this is my dipole along the Z, this is E theta. So E theta, it would be like this. That's your theta hat like that. This is your phi. So because you have a current like this and everything is symmetrical here, you can always argue by symmetry that if you have an E phi in this direction, why not having an E phi in the opposite direction like that? So if this is your E phi, why not, why not this one? So and the, by this type of symmetry, you can, you can understand it for yourself that E phi is essentially zero in this case. So, uh, so think about that and uh, uh, try to understand it from physics that why E phi is also zero. But from the equation, is is quite clear so i have my er e theta and e phi and now the next step is to find my h and h is also very easy because if you remember h is related to e by plane wave equation which in this case it's r hat cross e divided by impedance of the free space 377 ohm and you can just r hat cross and what is your e e Remember, E in general is R component R hat plus theta component theta hat plus phi component phi hat. And you see that ER is zero, E phi is zero, so that's the only thing that remains. So you can just say E theta, theta hat divided by eta, and that's going to be R hat cross theta hat is phi hat. I'm reminding you about this rotation here, r hat theta hat is gonna be phi hat. So that would be my phi hat and e theta divided by eta. And what is your e theta? e theta is that. So you can just write it here that it's phi hat j omega sine theta divided by eta. A, Z. That's your H. So as you see, we have our H as well. And if you also note here is that E has theta direction and H has, it has phi direction. And as you know, theta hat and phi hat are perpendicular to each other. So essentially you get uh, you get your plane wave. So if I try to plot that, I don't know if I can do a good job here or not in terms of plotting this, but this is your R hat, of course. That's your R hat. So now this would be theta hat. So this is your theta hat. As you see, if you want to think about theta hat, think about it this way, that uh, if this is your sphere, a Cartesian coordinate here, you know by definition, this angle is theta. So now if you want to change theta, imagine that you need to apply a force 
let's call this rod, on this rod to move it, to change your angle theta. And this force, if it's a unit vector, it's your theta hat. So as, you, as you're applying the force theta hat, you're moving this rod like this, and this angle increases. So that's your theta hat here. So that's my electric field. That's the direction of propagation. And now phi hat is a bit complicated in this plot to show, but phi hat is essentially the vector uh, uh, in this point is actually going into, into the whiteboard here. So is essentially these are these are our phi hat. So if I want to show phi hat, this is a phi hat. So the direction of phi hat changes. And as you enter here, the phi hat, as you see, is going to go into the whiteboard. So that would be your phi hat here. So this is the direction of theta. This is the direction of phi hat. These are all phi hat on this circuit. But as you're changing the position, phi hat changes its direction. And when you get to this point, it goes into the whiteboard. So that's your phi hat. But this might uh, get complicated when you think of uh, a general point in the 3D. But if you now think of, for example, this point, everything becomes easy in this point. Because what is theta on this point when you are on the y-axis? Remember, this is your theta. Theta changed like that. At this point, was like this. Here is like this. Here, theta becomes like this. So your theta theta hat, when you are on the y-axis, is essentially parallel to z. So it's negative z hat axis, the way that I have it. And that's the amazing thing about a spherical coordinate. You see, here is theta hat, here is theta hat. But if you wanted to write it in Cartesian coordinate, you had something here and you had another thing here. But in a spherical coordinate, all of these electric field is in the theta hat direction because theta hat changes its direction, but z hat is always like that. So it, when you are on the y-axis, your theta hat is essentially parallel to z, is negative z hat axis. And what about your phi? Phi is like this. Imagine there is a circle here. And then phi changes like this. So I'm, I'm moving on over this circle. This is my phi. This is my phi. When I get here, I'm tangential to this. And then I'm going into the whiteboard again. So if I go into the whiteboard, the direction of my phi hat is essentially negative of x hat. So this is essentially your phi hat, which would be negative of x hat in this case. And then your r hat, which is radially outward, for example, at this point is this. But when you are at this point, this is your r hat. So your r hat is essentially this vector, which is y hat. So your r hat is the same as y hat. So, so these are the direction of electric field and magnetic field. And you see why we are using a spherical coordinate. Otherwise, it would be very complicated every time you want to have one direction. But here, things are very much consistent. So that's my E and H. And usually when you get your E and H, uh, you may not see so much in those equations. So if you don't see so much in those equations, they have lots of information. But uh, for me personally, I see uh, better when I convert it to power density. So I would personally uh, recommend that whenever you have your E and H, convert it to power density to get a better feeling of what's going on. So let me do that. So let me do that. So how, how I'm going to find power density? Power density, remember, it was watt per meter square. So it's essentially tell you that in an area in a space, how much power is passing. So that's my power density. And power density, I can find it by half E cross H complex conjugate. So this is, this is essentially your power density, half E cross H complex conjugate. I want to remind you about power in circuit, which is half VI complex conjugate, V for E, I for H, H is amp per meter, I is amp. Electric field volt per meter, 
this is voltage. So therefore, this is watt, and this one would become watt per meter square. So these are, uh, you could see that uh, these are connected to each other. Now, if I find my power density, let's see what I'm going to get. So I'm going to get half. What is my E? J omega sine theta AZ. That's my E. Don't forget the direction. This is a vector. So it's theta hat. Cross with, what is my uh, H? H is this uh, vector here. So it's a phi hat. And what you remember, you need to complex conjugate that. So remember, if you have, for example, a number like 2 plus J3, complex conjugate becomes 2 minus J3. So the imaginary part becomes negative of what you have. So... So if I go by that, J becomes minus J, omega sine T. Eta is a real number, at least in free space, 377. So I'm not going to touch that. And AZ, in general, this can be a complex number. So I'm going to have complex conjugate here. So that's, the, uh, that's what I'm going to have. Therefore, if, I, if you multi, uh, multiplying, Theta hat cross phi hat becomes R hat. So that's one thing. So you get half R hat. So maybe I start with R hat. R hat, half. Then uh, J times J becomes negative one. You have already have a negative, so you get positive. So you get omega two here. So you get your omega two divided by eta. And then you get your sine 2 theta. And then you get your AZ times AZ complex conjugate. So remember, if you have a number like C times its complex conjugate, then the answer would be magnitude of C to the power of 2. So I'll make you make an example. 2 plus J3 and then times 2 minus J3. This one is complex conjugate of that. The answer would be magnitude of 2 plus j3 to the power of 2. And magnitude means real part square 4 plus imaginary part square 9, which would be 13 in this case. So you're going to have magnitude of az squared. So yeah, you're going to have magnitude of az squared. Now, to find the magnitude of az squared, Let's see what we have. So it's going to be, again, r hat, half, omega 2, eta, sine 2, theta. What is magnitude of A? So this is magnitude. This is my AZ, Z component. So magnitude of this square would be mu naught to the power of 2, 4 pi to the power of 2. So I have that. And then I naught L. So I naught can be a complex number. Remember, I naught is a phasor. So uh, it's going to be magnitude of I naught to the power of 2. L becomes L2. And then what is magnitude of E to the power of J theta? Remember, this is, I mentioned that several times. E to the power of J theta in terms of magnitude is 1. And to understand that, you can go cos theta plus j sine theta for that. And if you take magnitude squared, would be real part squared, cos 2 theta, imaginary part squared, sine 2 theta, and that's 1. So this is always 1. So this, therefore, magnitude of this is 1. That disappears. This becomes 1 divided by R2. And don't include z hat because that's just a z component. So the direction is already here, R hat. So I have now everything that I need. So let's see what I can do uh, with this, uh, with what I have here. So uh, if, I, if I simplify that, then it becomes R hat. Then I'm going to have half. Then omega 2, maybe omega mu naught divided by 4 pi to the power of 2 divided by eta. 
then i naught square l square sine 2 theta so did i include everything so i have omega mu naught i have it here I have 4 pi, the whole thing to the power of 2, 2 eta, and I have all of these. And the only thing I don't have is my r square that I have here. So that becomes my power density. Hopefully, I haven't missed any term. If I missed any term, my apologies, but I have not missed any important terms at least. So now let's see what does this power density mean? So the most important thing I want you to notice regarding this power density is that this power density, first of all, is in the direction of r hat. So when I had my antenna in the center of, uh, in the origin like that, this essentially tells me that in the far field, because I went by far field approximation, in the far field, what's happening is that my power density is in the r hat direction. So this is my power density. This antenna is going to be radiating like this. So if this is a sphere here, so this is going to be the direction of power. So power goes like this. So in the direction of r hat. So this is my the direction of power. So because power, for example, could have theta direction or phi direction. But this says if you put this particular antenna at the origin, the power leaves in the r hat direction. Where? In the far field zone, not everywhere. So that's probably the most important observation here. Now, what's another observation? The other observation is that if you look at this power, do you see a complex number, or should I say it this way, does this quantity has an imaginary part, or it's purely real? If we look at this, we have this half, which is purely real. We have this uh, omega mu naught 4 pi eta for free space 377. We take the magnitude of a phasor, that's real. That's length, that sine is real, and r is real. So we don't have any imaginary part. But when we don't have an imaginary part, this power density is purely real. What, what does it mean to be purely real from resistance point of view, from, from maybe circuit point of view? From circuit point of view, when the power is completely real, means you're losing the power from the circuit viewpoint. But remember, this is radiation. So you essentially radiate away the power. So the power is going to be gone. So this is radiation. This is good loss for us because we are radiating the power. So we're not losing the energy to the dissipation. The power is essentially escaping from us. So that's, that's a positive thing that this is purely real. So that's another observation that we have here that the power is purely real. We don't have, we don't have anything like, for example, plus j something if we had j something then the power becomes uh, as an imaginary part therefore what happens is that that's going to be called a stored energy you're storing the power whereas in this case we are radiating so the power is gone essentially from that point so to understand this maybe a little bit better let me go to the circuit point of view so so if i go by circuit so if I have a resistor, V is equal Ri. So if I do power half Vi complex conjugate, what do I get? If I substitute I by V divided by R, you get half V2 divided by R. This is purely real. So that means you're losing the power here. From radiation, it's not dissipation. It's the power is escaping from you. Now, if I go, for example, with an inductor, what is V? V is J omega Li. Now, what, what's the meaning of that when you go to power? Half Vi complex conjugate. What would be the result of that? That would be half 
V, and then I becomes V divided by J omega L, you need to complex conjugate it so it would become V squared divided by minus J omega L. Now, if you look at the power in the case of an inductor, you see that you have J. So that essentially purely imaginary. That means this inductor, the power is purely imaginary. So it's a storage, only a storage. Here, we don't, I don't have that imaginary part. And I like the fact that I don't have imaginary part. And in fact, this is what happens in the far field. The power is purely real. So that's the second point about this equation. Now, okay, we just finished talking about the two important things about this equation. Now let's go to the third one. The third one is related to the fact that this power density here is related to R squared, one divided by R squared. So that's the very important thing, and that's what we have in the far field. So, and to understand this, let me again remind you that this is not power. This is power density, watt per meter squared. So keep that in mind. This is watt per meter squared. Now I'm asking you this question. Imagine you have this dipole, and I ask you, I have a sphere around the dipole. How much power is passing through this sphere? So what would you do? You integrate this power density over the area of the sphere. Now, what is the total area of a sphere if the radius is r? is 4 pi r squared. That's the area of the sphere. 4 pi r squared. That's the area of the sphere. So now, so you need to integrate that over the area of the sphere. Now, if I, if I now tell you this is, was your antenna, this was the first sphere. Now imagine a second sphere, which is larger. What is the total power passing through that? Then what would you do? You again integrate power density over this larger sphere. Now, what happens to the total area of the sphere? Remember, the area of the sphere, when the sphere gets larger, becomes larger because it, this is the area of the sphere. So the area of the sphere increases with respect to r this way, 4 pi r squared. So to keep the total power the same, because we don't have dissipation in free space, to keep the total power the same, because the area increases, power density needs to drop. So this is not the drop of power in, in our case. The total, this is not the drop of the total power. This is the drop of power density. So power density essentially drop as a factor of one divided by r squared. And so this is the third thing about, uh, about this equation. Now, I want to go back uh, to a couple of other things about this, uh, these equations that I have here. So one other thing that I want to mention here is the R dependency of E and H in the far field. So if you look at the R dependency of E in the far field, what is the R dependency of E in the far field? So you see here, E is related to AZ. And AZ has an R dependency equal to that. So the R dependency of E is essentially E to the power of minus JKR divided by R in the far field. Now, what about H? H is exactly the same thing. H is related to az as you see so this is also e to the power of minus jkr r so if you if you look at if you look at this you see that the r dependency of electric field and magnetic field both of them are a function of r and that's why when you multiply them to get to the power density, when you multiply them to get to the power of power density, power density would be R squared. But E and H is R with respect to uh, with respect to R. So it's one divided by R in this case. Now this is how ha this happens in the far field, and uh, that's essentially why we could have these radiations. I'm going to discuss that later on when I, when I calculate E and H, both in the near field and far field. But remember, this 1 divided by R 
is very important. If you want to understand the importance of it, remember the electric field of a static charge that you studied in ECE 3580. Electric field of a static charge. So I'm talking about electrostatic. Here in radiation, the charge, we have accelerating charge or time varying current. Now I'm talking about a static charge that's sitting somewhere. What is the electric field of that? If you remind yourself about that, you see that this static electric field is related to one divided by R squared. Whereas this radiating electric field or magnetic field is related to one divided by R. So when you compare the topic here with the topic of electrostatic in ECE 3580, pay attention to this difference of one divided by R here and one divided by R square for the electric field in the static case. That's, that's another point. The other thing that I want to mention to you is the term that you're going to be hearing a lot in the far field, that E and H in the far field are in phase. What does that mean? That essentially means, for example, whatever E does, H want to do the same thing. For example, if, uh, so if E increases, H increases too, and so on. So this is essentially the in-phaseness of electric and magnetic field. Now, uh, if you want to understand it a little bit better, maybe I can go again to the circuit and mention it to you, and hopefully you will understand it better. So let me keep this equation for now in case I need that, and I'm just going to get rid of this part to go over this topic. So let me make a little boundary here. So... So you see, in circuit, if I have V here, and this is R, and this is my I, I say V is equal RI. So now, whatever phase I has, V is going to have the same phase, because R cannot change the phase. R is just the real number. So if, if I write that as, for example, if I write I as I naught e to the power of J phi for magnitude and phase, what would be my V? V becomes R I naught e to the power of J phi. So that means it has the same phase. So V and I are in phase, essentially, when it comes to a resistor. So, but now let's go to the same example for inductor. So, if this is my V, if this is my I, what is V? V is J omega L I. Now, if I substitute I by I naught e to the power of J phi, when I multiply this by this, remember J is 90 degree phase difference. So J is the same as e to the power of J 90. So I can write that as e to the power of J 90 omega L for J omega L. So that would be your V. So your V becomes in fact omega L I naught e to the power of J phi plus 90. So you see, the phase of V is going to be 90 degree difference with, with the phase of I. So we, we call that they're in, co so they're out of phase by 90. So phase quadrature. So essentially that V and I are not in phase anymore here. But now look at what we have in the far field. In the far field, H is related to E just by real number. I mean, of course, you have this R hat cross to change the direction. So if this is your E, this would be your H. But if you look at here, this is very similar to the concept of resistor that maybe it's more clear if I write it as I equal V divided by R because I is amp, H is amp per meter. So if you look at that, there is only one real number here, 377, that's, that's changing. That, uh, that changing magnitude of H with respect to E. And in, the, and in this case that I have here, so I don't get any, any uh, uh, phase change between these two. So essentially in the far field, H and E are in phase. So H and E would be in, are in phase and therefore 
that's another thing uh, to to notice here that this is what's what's happening in the far field so if you for example uh, look at a couple of plots that we may have in in different books for example sometimes they're plotting electromagnetic waves like this so and then so this is e and they're plotting h like this so if you look at some of the books you see that they for example say this is e this is h yeah so this is my e e this is my electric field. Remember, everything has time variation. So if I say this is my E, this is my H, and they're traveling, that's essentially with respect to time. I'm going to sometimes I have some maximum E, then it becomes a smaller and then change the direction and so on. So this is your E, and this is your H. So, and then this is the direction of propagation. So that's, that's the plot that you usually see in the textbook. And what does this plot show you? It actually shows you that E and H are in phase because look at this. E goes up, H goes up too. E gets a smaller here, H gets a smaller here, and so on. So E and H, they're, they're doing this mechanism together. So that's, uh, that's what we have in the far field. When, it, when it's near field, that's a different uh, story. Uh, and the reason we have it in the far field is remember that resistance, resistance in circuit is the loss of energy due to dissipation. Here we have escape of the energy, essentially. It's not dissipation, it's escape. And we have a similar mechanism here. So that's a couple of things about uh, the far field of of this uh, of this uh, infinitesimal dipole antenna. So let me let me a little bit summarize what we've done. So we started with uh, we, we found a magnetic vector potential of our infinitesimal dipole antenna. It was in Z hat, so we converted it to a spherical coordinate. We converted it to a spherical coordinate, and now we have these A's in a spherical coordinate. Now, the next goal was to find E and H. Now, if I want to E and H, I said maybe for simplicity, that's the first time we're doing it, and that's going to be anyways the focus of our course. Let's going to do it in far feet. If I do it in far feet, then I can use these approximations, which are very valid. But uh, I mean, if you want to be very precise, you may want to have uh, a little bit of approximation. But as soon as you get large enough, then they're very accurate. Then these are the equations that I'm going to use. So I, I have these. And then I can find my H based on plane wave approximation. Then I said, when you look at the expression for E and H, you may not see things immediately. But let's go to power density and try to understand power density better. And then we mentioned a couple of important things about power density. Now, one thing that remains here, and we could still talk about that, is another important point about power density that I missed. And that's the angular dependency of power density. Look at this. This is the heart of the antenna design here. So we essentially started with the current distribution, which was infinitesimal dipole antenna. And look at what we've got we essentially got an angular dependency of sine a square theta. That essentially means we are not distributing power the same everywhere, like an isotropic antenna, but we favor some direction. We send more power in some direction, less power in other direction. Now, which, which angle we send the maximum power? Theta equal 90. So if this was my... If this was my dipole antenna, like that, along the z-axis, what is theta equal 90? This is theta equal 90. So in the azimuth plane or xy plane, you are sending the maximum energy. So if this is my dipole and this plane, which is all theta equal 90, I'm sending the maximum of power. But if theta becomes 0 or 180, that means 
this direction is theta zero, this direction is theta equal 180. I'm not sending any power. So if this is my dipole, I have a null here and I have another null in this direction. So that's essentially the power density that I have. Now we talked about this and uh, perhaps we could do one more thing. I have a still a few minutes. So what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna now go to radiation intensity. So remember what was radiation intensity by definition? Radiation intensity which was u, u was essentially r2 times w, but you multiply r2 by w, but then also you don't consider r hat because we know in the far field we are always r hat. So I didn't write it as a vector. These are non-vector. So you, you don't care about r hat because that's we, we know it. And we multiply it by r2 so that r2 is gone now. We only have angle. So if you do that, then you get your radiation intensity, which would be essentially half omega mu naught to the power of 2, 4 pi eta i naught L sine 2 theta. So that's, that's essentially becomes our radiation intensity. So now we have our radiation intensity and you know that the dimension becomes watt because this was watt per meter square. You multiply it by meter square, so radiation intensity is watt, is the watt that you have in a cone, different cones around the antenna. And U in general is a function of theta and phi, but for this particular antenna, there is no phi dependency because if you go around the antenna, you don't see any change. You still see the same thing. So that's our radiation intensity. Now, what else we could do with this? The other thing that we could do with this, which is very important for us, in fact, is to find the total radiated power. So let's see how we can find the total radiated power. So how do you find total radiated power by the antenna? P rad. If you remember, that was the integration of U over element of solid angle. So essentially, these are the power in different cones around the antenna. You sum them up, then you get the total power radiated. So essentially, you get... Uh, this expression that you have here, let me just write this expression as this to save some time. And then you have sine 2 theta here. And what was d omega? That was sine theta d theta d phi. So I need to integrate that. And I know that phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. Theta goes from 0 to pi. So uh, if I integrate over phi, because there is no phi dependency, I get 2 pi. This is constant, so I'm going to have that. And then I get integral of 0 to pi sine cube theta d theta. If I integrate sine cube theta, which I, which I did before, uh, if I remember correctly, that was 4 divided by 3. So I'm going to have 2 pi, my expression and 4 divided by 3. So 2 pi times this, 4 divided by 3. That's the total power radiated by the antenna. And remember, total power radiated doesn't have theta because you integrate over the whole space. So that becomes your total power radiated by the antenna. Now, you need to find directivity of the antenna. So let's try to find the directivity of the antenna. How do you find the directivity? Remember, the directivity equation was comparison between the radiation intensity of your antenna with that of an isotropic. Assuming that isotropic radiate the same amount of power, the radiation intensity of isotropic was P rad equally distributed over 4 pi. 
the total solid angle. So that's going to make it 4 pi u theta phi divided by p rad. So now, if you if you make if you make this division, uh, you're going to be looking at 4 pi u theta phi is this. So I had this sine 2 theta divided by 2 pi, the same thing, 4 divided by 3. So now I can cancel 2 pi with 4 pi, that becomes 2, and that's going to bring me to 6 divided by 4 sine 2 theta, or this becomes 3 divided by 2, 1.5 sine 2 theta. So this becomes my directivity. Now, what is my maximum directivity is 1.5. So maximum directivity, which is D naught, is 1.5. Now, what does that mean? That means in the direction of maximum radiation, this antenna radiates 1.5 times more than the isotropic antenna. So let's stop here and then we continue with the discussion in the next class.